Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you guys so much for joining. I know you guys um, get tired of me saying the same thing, but I appreciate your participation. These webinars would not be a success without um, you guys tuning in um, every third Wednesday of each month. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead on and um, get started. Um, I want to thank our presenters for today. We have David Perry, we have John Mills, and we have Harold Weinbrett. Did I say that right, Harold? Yes, you did. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to introduce David initially, and then um, David will introduce his colleagues. So without further ado, um, David Perry is a stormwater sen uh, senior project manager. He has 25 plus years of experience in stormwater management, planning, design, permitting, and policy. Um, municipal client focus grew out of previous employment at the City of Charlotte Stormwater Services Group. Um, he led Withers Revenal Stormwater Practice in Western North Carolina for the past two years. Um, his areas of expertise are watershed master planning, urban stormwater retrofit, and culvert replacement. Um, David, thank you so much for your time um, and sharing with us today. And I will be quiet and I will let you have the floor. Thank you so much, Michelle. Really appreciate the opportunity to share with uh, this terrific group of people who tune into these webinars. Uh, and my main role will be to introduce Harold, uh, who is a local government asset management specialist with Withers Ravenel, as well as having the distinction of being the mayor of Cary since 2007 and uh, a long career as an elected official, which has given him the opportunity to be past chairman of the Capital Area Metropolitan Planning Organization, as well as past president of Wake County Mayor's Association. So that means that Harold certainly brings a lot of experience with government relations and economic development. And then in addition to Harold, we've got John Mills, a strategic asset management professional who uh, joined Withers Ravenel with uh, 10 years of uh, plus uh, in local government asset management and technology projects. Uh, in addition to being a previous APWA board member in both North Carolina and Florida. So brought Harold and John on board because they both bring a, a great deal of expertise with our asset management offerings. And in particular, uh, we can speak to you about that with regards to stormwater management. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to John to lead the presentation. Great, thank you, David. So, yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, you know, I think uh, also in the chat, if down in the bottom right, feel free to ask questions as we go. David's going to collect those at the end. We'll we'll talk through any questions that come up, any comments. So we we appreciate those and um, think about questions you might have for Harold as a as a uh, elected official and thinking about it from that perspective. Um, Feel free to take you and you know, make use of that time with him here today. So I think where we want to start um, is just kind of define our term here, asset management. Uh, it's one of those nebulous terms that can kind of mean a few different things. So I want to first just explain what it is not. Um, what we're not talking about is the financial services world. We're not talking about accounting type of finance asset management. Um, I know uh, I kind of come from the software technology space where I feel like they've kind of owned that word to some degree, asset management software. We're not just talking about that. Uh, there's definitely a financial component and a software technology component to what we're going to talk about, but it's not, that's not the breadth of everything we're, we're covering. And we're not just talking about capital planning and not just talking about uh, prioritization of, of uh, capital uh, expenses. We're, we're, we're talking about more of a, um, an overall process is it, kind of how we're, you know, defining that term. And I think, um, I think the EPA has a really good definition for asset management that it's really good to work from. It's simple. And it's just that asset management is maintaining a desired level of service for what you want your assets to provide at the lowest life cycle cost. And I think that's a. That's a, it's a good place to start, in my opinion. So, I, I want to break down what we kind of see as the kind of the ten steps of like the process. If you had to break it down into just some bite-sized chunks, 
what this asset management process looks like, and we'll be kind of operating from this as a as a foundation for today. So, you know, you start with just understanding. Um, you identify what assets you have, what stormwater do we have out there, what um, what SCMs, what you know, every everything we have out in the field. A lot of times you gather that and put that in a GIS database. You have certain attributes like material length. Diameter, you have all these step, um, particular details about those assets that you might put into a GIS database. Uh, from there, you move on to, you know, we want to collect a history. We want to know what happens, what, what maintenance and repairs do we do? Uh, what, what issues is this asset causing us over time? So we want some kind of history on that. And then we want to understand condition, you know, right now or recently, what state is it in? Are we using CCTV? Are we, what are we doing to understand the state of our assets now, besides maybe um, how old it is? And then we move on to understanding what, what are these assets worth? What does it cost to replace them? Um, you know, how much risk do we have in these assets? Um, what was the level of criticality if they were to fail? How, how big of a deal is that? And then we want to understand full life cycle of the whole system. Like, how are things going to fail over time? And then we get into funding. We add money into the equation. How much money can we actually put into capital planning? Uh, what are our different strategies or different um, treatment options, if you will? Or um, and, and so we we put we put these different scenarios into play, and then we we have conversations with elected officials and leaders, and we we ask for funds. We hopefully get some of those funds. We go execute on projects. We measure what we did. We uh, we take note of any data changes along the way, any any improvements to the actual status of these assets, and then hopefully we get to a proactive state where we're PMing and maintaining these assets, not just on a reactive basis, but we're we're staying ahead of things. And then that whole process just goes in a loop over and over. So that's that's the gist of what we're talking about as an asset management process. And and I'll just say that this is really a um, it, it's, it's step dependent. So the idea is, you know, if you do one process, uh, you know, if you, if you lack in one area, it might affect the, the consequential next steps. So if we don't have a good identification of our, all of our assets, it's going to be really hard to get a good history to do a good condition assessment. If we don't know what we have as an example. So I'll start there. Um, I think just to in the chat in the bottom, right, you'll see that chat button. Uh, I'd love for anybody who is in a municipal or local government type scenario, and that's if you're a professional working for a locality, would love to see what percentage of your stormwater assets are gathered and in a GIS database of some sort. If you wouldn't mind just putting up a percentage, it can be zero, it can be 50%, 100%. I'm just curious kind of what we're seeing from the group today, if you guys don't mind. We're seeing 25%. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks, Brandon. And, and I say this just because this is where it all starts. You know, it's hard to do a lot of these other steps we're going to talk about today until you have that, that, that general understanding of what you have. And this is what I would expect, a big range. Um, and, and definitely some of the more urban um, localities have some more stringent rules about you, you need to get this inventory together, but, um, and people are on a different journey. People have a different amount gathered. So that's great. It's good to see that there's some 90 percenters out there and some 25s. It's, it's a good range. That's good. That's great. Good, Bob. Great. So today, what we're, what we're really focused on here is we want to focus on these four in, in the green circles here. Um, when we have. Harold with us. I think he's going to provide a lot of insight on a few of these things. And we find that this is kind of the part of the process that gets difficult to scale. It's hard to do this at scale, basically. You have so much data and so many assets and so many things going in so many directions. It's hard to do this well. So we just want to speak to this and show some, some lessons learned. Uh, and, and this is the four categories of kind of assessing risk, the full life cycles, and, and building scenarios around funding and modeling and even getting into kind of the negotiation and discussion with the leadership. So from there, I'm gonna turn it over to Harold. Harold, do you mind giving us a little bit of um, 
background on Carrie and some of the challenges you guys saw and kind of introduce us to, to your story. Sure, be glad to. Carrie, uh, 20, 25 years ago was uh, experiencing a lot of greenfield development. And uh, at the time we were receiving uh, flooding complaints. Um, mostly were from existing neighborhoods that have been there for quite a while. So some of the initial steps we took were to enact uh, stormwater mitigation ordinances, such as no platting in floodplains, make sure you handle storm events, those types of things. But that didn't really address the existing problems. So uh, being the naive council members we were at the time, we asked our staff to, okay, go investigate and come back with a solution. Well, when they investigated, they found that the problem was pretty big and pretty expensive. And in fact, the problem was somewhere in the hundreds of millions of dollars, which from an elected official's point of view, or probably from a staff point of view, just wasn't doable. So we decided that the best way to proceed was to tackle certain areas of town with a pilot program to address the issues that we could find. And we chose our downtown since that was the oldest part of Cary. Cary started as a one square mile and grew out to be over 60 square miles today. A little backstory on our downtown, um, has the oldest structures, um, not a lot of activity going on at the time. At five o'clock, basically, we shut off the lights, rolled up the sidewalks, and everybody went home. So it was a ghost town. And we decided that we were going to revitalize our downtown. And part of that revitalize, revitalization effort was to buy up properties and to spur economic development. So knowing that we had that in mind and had existing flooding issues made sense that we should start in downtown before we did anything else. So the first step was to identify what was causing the problems in the flooding issues in downtown, and then decide what actions we could and should take. Jump one more slide there. Yep. Some of the problems we found were not surprising. We had clogged storm drains and pipes and clogged or eroded culverts. We had paving over uh, aprons, which essentially made the curb and gutter useless. And we found that some of the piping and culverts were on private property, which created a maintenance issue. And while it was a risk to invest all this time and effort and money in basically what was a ghost town after 5 p.m., it was probably more of a risk not to. And, and even though we were a young council, we realized this. And we realized that if we didn't address these issues, they would get worse. We would have more flooding and more infrastructure failure. And that could lead to more businesses leaving our downtown, more residents leaving our downtown, creating bas basically an economic blight. And so we realized that that just wasn't an option and we had to do something. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So. And, and that kind of get, brings us back to a risk. So, um, again, the, the idea of calculating the risks that are at hand and, and how we start to prioritize our asset replacement strategy. Again, this is building on understanding what our assets are, hopefully having a history in place, some understanding of condition or age. And then we start to step into this risk calculation and the idea here, uh, risk is a calculation of probability. Uh, or likelihood of failure and severity or consequence of failure. It's, it's that times, it's probability times severity equals risk. So what I want to go through is just a really basic example of scorecard you might use in for stormwater to determine first uh, consequence, or sorry, uh, likelihood of failure just on a simple 1 to 10 scale. And I, and I just want to preface this with um, you might alter all three of these categories, you might add another one. Uh, it could be very different for your locality, depending on several things. Might add in 
CCTV data, if you have that, you might um, change these age ranges a little bit, even depending on the material we're talking about. Um, you might weight this scoring a little bit different. And uh, you might change look at the bottom there. You might change the actual number of work orders we're talking about, depending on how much history you actually have. But I wanted to at least give you a flavor for what this scorecard could look like. So, uh, in, in red, you'll see highlighted just a, an example of what um, I guess the, the worst example or the, the most likely to fail example would be, and that would be older than seventy years old, um, corrugated metal pipe. Um, and greater than nine work orders in our system, that would yield a, a score of 10. So this is likely a failure. Um, we, we would do this for each segment of pipe in this example, uh, and this would start to gather a, a really large pool of data on likely. The next piece, the consequence of failure exercise, so the same kind of idea, one to 10 scale, um, and you might change things like I'll, I'll explain it as I go through it, but basically the, the worst case example in this 1 to 10 scale would be greater than 15,000 daily trips impacted uh, trips being like actual commerce, you know, roads and impacting to and from um, A to B type need for your locality and then um, greater than 50 structures impacted by flooding. I think this one could actually be changed to uh, potentially be like more dollar based and value of those properties or structures. So you could get into some of that if you have that data. But in this, in this most negative um, scenario, greater than 15,000 trips impacted more than 50 structures impacted. Um, significant extensive environmental impacts. And uh, you're impacting essential services like medical and schools, that would yield a 10 in terms of consequence of failure. So the idea here is that we're we're building these scores and we are um, want to build out a matrix ultimately. So again, we're just multiplying the one axis and the other axis, likelihood of failure, consequence of failure, getting an idea of how many linear feet of pipe in this example, we have in each of these buckets. So uh, the red obviously is very high risk, green, very low risk. Um, and, and we're starting to kind of put these into categories. So um, as far as strategy, we start to, we're starting to think about prioritization now, once we get and what most localities do that I've seen, um, the general idea is you attack that black square at the top first. You know, you do your your worst first, and and that's not always um, the worst idea. A lot of times, that you have to do some of those for sure. I think the idea here is sometimes it makes sense to target some of these red squares because there are actual um, treatments. There are um, uh, there are uh, rehabilitations that that we can do to bring these assets back up to 95%, 90% life, and it will cost maybe a third or a quarter of the of the price tag of, of handling projects in the black box. So as you'll see, this just starts to be not, not a hard math problem, but just a very large math problem. There's just so many iterations, so many permutations that you could go through to think about this, this challenge right here. So uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Harold for a second, but Harold, if you will, tell us more about how you looked at like the impact of those challenges in carry and how you thought about likelihood and just just some of the initial thoughts around um, around around those types of topics. Sure. Uh, one of the things that came to mind when you were talking about the consequence of failure and the impacts was I remember citizens telling me. You know, if we have flooding in our crawl space. We're worried that it's going to come through the first floor. Uh, so those types of stories have a huge impact on elected elected officials uh, in their decision making. So what we did, we, we started this journey with the stormwater mitigation in the early 2000s, and by the mid 2010s, 
we had a lot of moving parts. So we had already invested millions of dollars in our downtown's revitalization. We had identified flooding issues. We also identified other linear assets that needed attention in addition to the flooding issues. And uh, we decided that if we're gonna get our economic development engine going, we needed to come up with not only the obvious solutions, but creative solutions for flooding issues. And, and part of this initially was to understand why we had the issues in the first place. And so by understanding that we, we realized that, yeah, we let our stormwater assets go into the point of failure. And so we had linear assets that were probably approaching that as well. The downtown area, as I said, was the oldest part of Cary. Cary's 152 years old, no telling how old the stormwater assets and the linear assets were. And what was their life cycle? Well, we were probably at the end of their life cycle. And so that was a big part of the problem. And we realized that we had neglected these for the most part until we had a serious problem with flooding. That's great. And I think that that's important to think about, you know, a lot of the models you can run, run things to failure and then you rebuild from new. But um, I do want to readdress that idea of asset rehabilitation. So, um, again, th th these can cost a lot less than, than, you know, rip and replace in full. Uh, and that might be CIPP, spin casting, inverter replacement. Uh, grouting the soil around your pipes, you know, there, there are multiple types of ways to bring these things back up to, um, to full or near full uh, capacity. And, and every asset like this is going to have a curve, a different, a different curve, depending on the asset class and the asset type. Um, so it's important just to model this. How, how do these assets fail over time and, and how much life can we get back and how much does it cost? Uh, we're adding that into these models as well. We want all of these conditions. We want all these assets, all this, um, all this risk data, and then all the potential treatments that we're okay with that we, we, we believe are helpful and possible. We want to build all of these things into our potential funding scenarios so that we can ultimately compare all of these things. Um, so. Yeah, um, and, and the other thing that we we want to base this on is our history. Like what what have we seen work and not work? Um, you know, is is cure in place, you know, our legitimate option for us or not? And so I, I think again, there's a little bit of art in all of this. You know what works in your community. You know your soil type. You know your community and the expectations. There are certain things that will and won't work depending on what you've what you've been through. Um, and then from there. So that was one asset. What we're trying to get to ultimately is to this kind of uh, a profiled version of that where we look at every asset, um, every asset in our stormwater portfolio all together and looking at it over time. So we're taking what this is is a view of like different investment strategies, different funding strategies based on all this data we have around condition, around risk that we calculated. Uh, our rehabilitation options that we we talked about, the different funding scenarios, and again those levels of service that we want to hit. So that's that's a lot of data. That's a lot of different things to factor in. But but that's where technology starts to really make this math problem easier. Is you can insert all of these if thens and all these components and understand year over year what to expect. And so the idea is we want to get dozens of or, or at least a dozen you know different investment strategies if we put in x million dollars this year and then every year after that we do uh 60 of that ongoing what does that what does that accomplish so um i think this is where we get into really translating what the needs are for the stormwater group and, and people to understand things from a technical perspective we're starting to translate that into what citizens and leadership will really understand to make the, the right decision. And so that's, that's the idea here is, is we're starting to compile all this data and say, so what, um, Carol, I, I guess 
But as far as the solutions you guys came up with, what what options did you have? What what were you kind of considering as you as you thought about your your challenges there and carry? Usually, as an elected official, you get three options: do nothing, do everything, or do something. <laughs> and so uh, we were we were always toward the do almost do everything. We couldn't afford that. But we did know that uh, we had to be creative in looking for solutions in our downtown. One thing we were doing in our downtown was creating a downtown park right next to our signature street, which is Academy Street. And we knew we wanted to have water features in the park. And we also realized that this park was upstream from a lot of the flooding issues. So we decided that not only could we create an aesthetic feature that would be very pleasing to everybody, but we could create a stormwater device that would retain some of that water upstream. So that was one of the solutions. And the other solutions were pretty straightforward. Uh, they were the solutions such as um, cleaning, rebuilding, relocating culverts, and cleaning out storm drains. Uh, so that was pretty obvious and pretty straightforward. But another thing uh, we decided to do was purchase uh, two jet back trucks. Now that was a very expensive uh, risk that we took, but uh, we knew it would not only help us immediately in our downtown, but we could use this all over town to address all the flooding issues that we had. So if we move forward, so th what's the epilogue? What did we learn from all of this? Well, in the process, we, we realized that we were fortunate to have a lot of good things work well for us. We started by creating a working group of uh, experts, such as professors on stormwater. We had expert staff, and we involved the citizens that were being impacted. And we had them come up with some of the solutions, such as monitoring devices and streams that allow us not only to monitor, but provide data or flooding events in the future. And that allows us to make further adjustments. And using our downtown as a pilot, we worked through a lot of the kinks and figured out how to best tackle some of the flooding issues in other parts of town. And our return on investment was huge. So we went from a ghost town from about 20, 25 years ago to a town, downtown that ex is experiencing a rebirth. And as a result of our action, we've seen massive investment in our downtown. And I've been telling everybody that you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the downtown park I mentioned, condos across the street from that park are going for $1.3 million. And we've had several new office buildings being built that are 100% pre-leased. Having any office building fully occupied is pretty amazing, but having them pre-leased is Pretty remarkable. Even Withers, even Withers Ravenel is going to go in one of those buildings in our downtown. So um, we had a lot of success with our our pilot, and what we could have done better was probably to realize that a lot of the problems with our stormwater and linear assets have a life cycle, and we should have paid attention to that before we reached failure. And so moving forward, that's exactly what we're doing. We're we actually have right now uh, some projects going on that are paying attention to the life cycle of those assets. And we realize now that they're the keystone to rebuilding our downtown and keeping our community strong. So that's exactly uh, what we're doing now. That's great. I, I love the, I love this project because I think it, it gets into the strategic side of what asset management can be. I mean, I think you you guys factored in economic development and a lot of other top line impacts that this would have. Uh, and I don't think that's always factored into some of these ideas and the the ideation around what can we do here. Um, I guess the question I have for you, Harold, is is like how how did you get how did you get um, the, all the stakeholders behind you on this? Was it difficult? Was it relatively easy to Get, get consensus around this pursuit? Well, it, there's a lot of trust and um, understanding that has to go between council and staff. Staff realized that 
uh, what the council was facing. So basically, as an engineer, you have to come up with solutions, then you have to sell it to council, and council has to turn around and sell it to the public. And if one of those fails, it's just not going to happen in an elected official's world. So uh, trying to convince council, staff had to show the data, uh, had to dumb it down a little bit, had to show the consequences of not doing things, the consequences not only of infrastructure failure, but what that would do to your economy and what did that do to your vision and your goals. And I think they did that very well. And that allowed us to focus on solving some of these issues and working in a smarter way as we move forward. Yeah, that's really good. Well, um, you know, we're going to wrap up here on this, this slide here. Um, so feel free to, again, keep getting your questions in. I see a couple coming through. That's great. Um, but I guess, you know, the thing we're wrapping on here is just this idea of negotiating and you're speaking to that now, Harold, but I guess, um, you know, once you have good data, you can explain risk, you can explain these different financial scenarios. Um, well, what's the right way to come to somebody like you, Harold, and come to a, a council meeting and ask for funds? I, I know that, and there's a good question in the, in the chat about there's different ways to fund these things, but. If, if it does mean coming to a council and saying, um, here's why we'd like funds, what's the right way to do that? What's the right kind of data to bring to you? What are your thoughts? Uh, first of all, uh, you'd have to know your councils. Councils are very different. Um, you have some councils that two year cycles that are very political and the, the mention of a tax increase or, or big expenditures scares them a lot. Uh, so you have to be very careful how you approach those. Um, but other councils, if you give them the data and you show them uh, that this is money well spent and there's return on investment, then I think most of them will go in the right direction. Uh, but if you just jump to, hey, the fix is this, cost is this, uh, you're likely not going to get the result you want. In other words, you're not going to get the money you're asking for. And then they're not going to reach their vision and then they're going to be upset with you for not helping them realize their vision. Uh, so it's very important uh, that that conversation is a good one and the data is a good one in presenting it to a council. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, when they presented, uh, when you guys brought this project forth and you discussed all the logistics, did you guys talk about any of the downstream effects of like, for example, um, how you were going to maintain uh, all this new infrastructure? Did, 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 was there a request for more maintenance support or any any uh, kind of ongoing help around the project, or is that yet to be determined? Well, we we are still working on stormwater issues, and as we're fortunate, as I said, to be, be experiencing a rebirth. So as these rebirths occur, uh, we're seeing a lot of stormwater infrastructure replaced, redone. Uh, made bigger or have a more capacity and that's helping these issues as we move forward uh, one product project i remember right now is the meridian project so they're going to build this huge huge uh, mixed use development with retail and residential above they're going to extend the street install uh, storm water linear assets uh, everything and that will help that particular area of downtown. And another time, on another part of downtown, we're seeing uh, a cross section being redone, all the assets at the same time, the water, sewer, pavement, streetscape, stormwater, all that being done. And so it's very important as we move forward that we understand as a council, uh, all these things come into play. They are pieces, they are the foundation of everything we're trying to do. And I think staff did a great job of getting that point across uh, for us as elected officials to try to move forward as we revitalize our downtown, that these are key components uh, to the secret sauce that makes that happen. Right. Well, thank you, Harold. Um, David, do you, do you have any thoughts or questions before we kind of jump into the Q&A piece here? Really, the only thing I wanted to emphasize was uh... I think what Harold mentioned early on is give the elected officials options and with asset management uh, approach to managing a system, you know, the system 
And uh, as John mentioned, you can play out different scenarios in terms of how to approach maintenance, um, what to target, and what those costs are that are associated with different projects uh, to be able to give elected officials those options to be able to say, if we maintain it to the level that we want to, it's going to cost X, and that over so many years means this is the impact for funding. And if you've got an enterprise fund, is your fee correct? If you don't have an enterprise fund, uh, what does that do to your uh, revenue use in the general fund? So being able to then say, okay, if we aren't ready to do this, because maybe there's a two-year council cycle, here are some other options. Uh, this will get us to this kind of a life cycle, but you know, there's always a price to pay eventually, and everything has a lifespan. Right. Yeah, I do think that's really critical to be able to to say, if we keep funding things at this level, here's what we're going to get in 10 to 20 years. You can really show what what is that service level? What's it going to look and feel like for citizens? If you can clearly explain that and show that with data, I think that's pretty powerful. I think I think it, that's what this is ultimately is a is a really clear communication process so that everyone understands what's going on. Um, yeah, thank you guys. Uh, so. The one question I think uh, that kind of follows pretty smoothly from that was Francine asked about specifics about the town of Cary and how it funds the stormwater uh, projects. Is there a utility, an enterprise fund? Um, my understanding, we do have a utility fund, uh, but that's for water, wastewater. I'm not sure we pull from stormwater from that fund, but we may. So, uh, But I do know that big capital projects come from the general fund. And I think um, we had a question from Allison, which was kind of getting into some of the capacity evaluation aspect of developing your asset management model, which is dealing with infrastructure that connects to other jurisdictions infrastructure and specifically NCDOT. Um, and then uh, Charles mentioned, what about private ownership outside of the right of way? And I think the answer to that does vary depending upon the municipality and what level of service has been established in terms of stormwater management and uh, assets of the municipality. Um, but broadly speaking, the part of the process that assesses the capacity capability of the system would include evaluating what is existing in terms of NCDOT infrastructure and how that affects the assets that the municipality itself controls um, to the point where it can sometimes include maybe identifying NCDOT infrastructure that needs to be upgraded in order to have a cost effective management of the municipality's infrastructure. So, in other words, you don't necessarily want to upsize a municipal pipe three times larger than it really needs to be just because there's a uh, NCDOT pipe that's restricting flow. It might be one of those many options to say, perhaps team with NCDOT and get that uh, piece of asset that NCDOT owns upgraded so that uh, Overall, the costs are less for the municipality. In terms of uh, private ownership outside the right of way, in many cases, because those are carrying flow from a public right of way, uh, municipalities will take responsibility for those assets. And that would be part of the calculation. And uh, if the municipality takes control over that, then now that becomes a municipal asset with corresponding easements to be able to maintain that, but also then ensuring that there's less risk to structures that, of course, people in the municipality are paying their taxes or their stormwater fee to help uh, hopefully alleviate those risks. I think we've got a couple of other questions. Um, Let's see, let me throw this back to Harold, if you're familiar with how was the GIS team for the town of Cary involved in the process? Yeah, I was dreading that I would get a technical question like that. Uh, the, one of the fortunate things of being a mayor of a town of 182,000 people is 
you have staff doing a lot of the work and you really don't know what goes on under the covers to some extent. I know the GIS team was involved. Uh, what their involvement was, I have no idea. Uh, but I can definitely find out the answer to that question. In many cases, uh, municipal GIS team is a critical partner for us as consultants in building these types of models because even as uh, we may go and gather the data, we're working with the municipality to make sure we're working and setting that data up in a schema that is appropriate for the municipality. So those are the where the GIS experts for the municipality are driving the, the uh, car, if you will, in terms of making sure that um, databases in a format that they're able to work with to reach their goals and integrates well with what they've already gotten is maintainable for them. So typically that's a critical partner for us as consultants is the municipal GIS specialists. Let's see, uh, we've got uh, what's the definition of a linear asset? So in addition to stormwater asset management, Linear assets would often include our water, wastewater infrastructure, roadways. Um, what else, John? Am I forgetting anything? Those are kind of our highlights as far as what we're often working with uh, clients on for asset management. Anything underground infrastructure it could be sidewalks, roadways. Um, it can get into electrical even. It can get into electric cities and things like that too. Um, there's a lot of things that are just spatial spatial assets, not not facilities, not points on a map. It's more of a linear spatial element. And it all comes back to everything has a lifespan. So as long as you know what you own, what your assets are, and you don't lose track of the fact that that has a life and will need maintenance and uh, at some point replacement. Yeah, and I'll just say too, um, you know, one of the cool things about modeling is you can start to compare or, or put, if you have one public works department that has manages multiple asset classes, um, you know, stormwater is one component of that. But if you have these other teams um, and you need to kind of show what's happening over time for all of the teams to marry all of that together over time and show what are all the needs for all the department, all the divisions over time, that helps tell a really good story to the public works director and the other leadership about how things are going to happen. What, what's the smartest way to do projects that make sure we're not cutting into the road three times in three years, things like that, that can just be a lot more efficient. Um, so I, I say all that just because to work together as a team, you get a lot of economies and cost savings. And most of the time we're really focused on the, the gray infrastructure, the pipes for the stormwater asset management uh, maintaining and keeping track of those. But in addition, the open channels are a critical part of any, any municipal uh, system for stormwater, as well as uh, the larger rivers and creeks, which may have floodplains that need to be modeled. And one of the questions was, um, or one of the solutions sometimes in terms of risk and that uh, floodplain modeling comes up with is here are homes that are at risk. There may not be anything that is reasonably available as an option for changing the channel should we buy out that home as a more cost-effective solution. So one of the questions to Harold is uh, what's your experience in terms of selling uh, the idea of prohibiting development on certain lots where they're in the floodplain. Uh, it, it's uh, I'm lost words here because it reminds me the first time I got involved in local politics was when I was on the planning board. And the first thing we had was how far to let the developer plat into the floodplain. And I remember saying, I don't see why anybody would flatten a floodplain because flatten floodplain because of floods. And that made the newspaper. So we went from there. <laughs> That's where we were in the 90s. And uh, 
went, but, but to sell it, it was to understand that floodplains flood. And the mitigations we did initially, we did five-year storm events. Well, the five-year storm events started happening multiple times a year. So then we went to 20-year storm events that you had to handle those storm events in your development. And then that started happening more often. So now we're at 100-year storm events. Uh, so we're very protective of floodplains and flood areas and trying not to exacerbate a problem that existed instead tried to address it. So, um, yeah, you'll have to uh, convince council members that platting in a floodplain is not a good idea because flooding issues are probably going to become more and more of an issue as time goes on. And that's, to me, that's a one-on-one -on -one issue when you're addressing council members. If you go to them as a group, uh, they might react one way if you're trying to convince them on something that's as serious as platting in a floodplain. Uh, I would address them one at a time just to hear their thoughts and concerns. Well, why, why do you think we should allow this? And uh, then try to address that. And then after you've addressed all of them, then allow it to come to the full council and hopefully they'll make the right decision. But yeah, platting in a floodplain is a bad idea. So is it fair to say, Harold, that it required pain and experience for you guys yes. to start to change? I wonder. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Work. When you're see when you're seeing all these flooding issues around town, and you investigate, well, why did this happen? Well, because you got properties in floodplain. We had one guy that was complaining the most. His entire property was in the floodplain, and he was the one with the flooding in the crawl space, and so that was. One, you were talking about purchasing properties. We eventually purchased this property. And we had some newer structures that were built in the 90s, surprisingly, at the end of cul-de-sacs uh, where the storm drainage wasn't adequate. And we ended up uh, first trying to resize the drainage and then buying those properties. So over the years, we bought several properties. This may be a little bit uh, too in the weeds for you to be able to address in your particular case, but let's give it a try, Harold. Um, when you were going through your process in the town of Cary, was there any accounting for climate change potential when the models were developed? And then how was that received by citizens and council? Um, it sounded like you were mentioning at least with the floodplain assessments, that there was a, a moving target in terms of what you were trying to achieve there. Right, and we get floodplain maps. I think they're updated every year. And what used to be an intermittent stream is now a stream. And, and you're right, climate change is changing a lot of that. And our council is very in tune to climate change issues. We're very cognizant of, of impervious surfaces in developments and we frown on that. Uh, we look for as much uh, storm drain mitigation as possible and creative storm drains that are not only functional but aesthetically pleasing. Uh, so all those are big top issues for us. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's tough issue to address. Let's see, we've got a question from Scott on how to inventory the stormwater assets and is there H&H &H modeling on the system to determine if it's undersized? And yes, that's, that's where uh, me and my group get to play our role in this process uh, with doing some basic conceptual modeling of the system based on the asset information that we've received, whether that's from an existing municipal database or additional survey work that we've done uh, in conjunction with the municipality to further flesh out that system network. And yes, so that is to set target levels of service for our system and the extent of service, and then run that through our models for H&H &H analysis in order to try to determine what is at risk from a capacity standpoint.
see. We also had a question on what are some strategies for helping a small municipality keep their data updated annually? So certainly that does depend upon what a municipality is willing to invest. And in many cases, it can be a matter of if there's new development requiring the developer to provide the data to the municipality as that development is being completed so that that can be added into a system, a GIS uh, database and tracked for future reference and you know, eventual lifespan maintenance and replacement needs. There's of course always consultants available to help any small municipality. Um, so it's either internal staff time, there's always gonna be some internal staff time in order to maintain the municipal system. Uh, but gathering the additional data can to some extent be outsourced as developers complete work or if there's any missing infrastructure that wasn't gathered on the initial work, um, going out and getting that, whether with town forces or uh, consultants assistance. Yeah, the way we the way we do that um, as Withers Ravenel as a company, we we partner with people where we'll, we'll meet quarterly and do those updates. Um, so I think just getting a time on the calendar that you at least meet internally quarterly and talk through those changes, updates. Um, you revisit some of the assumptions in your plan. Uh, I think it's good to revisit um, condition, obviously, um, the likelihood of failure, the consequences of failure, risk, um, all these variables that are going into your plan. It's good to just revisit those and also any any new projects, anything that you brought back up to life, uh, to full life, um, you know, change those inputs and, um, Hopefully, you've got a model that can hang out with you and, and live and breathe. And, and, and uh, there's not a lot more math to do each time. It's just kind of updating the, the model. But that's that's how we do it. It's usually a quarterly meeting, and that's usually plenty to get get everything done in a relatively short amount of time. And John, does, to add, oh, I'm sorry, I was going to add on. Let me add quick to that. It does also require that public works, if you're replacing or upgrading or or even just uh, rehabbing parts of the system with internal forces as part of that workflow process recognizing gathering the updated data and bringing that back into the system so not just going out and doing the repair but also gathering the updated data go ahead harold and and, and i was going to add from an elected official's point of view uh small towns are much different from large towns in, in the way the mayor operates. The mayor is part of doing part of the CEO process with the manager uh, because there's just not enough staff. So to get the help that you need, to get uh, the the data or or this whether it be Withers Ravenel or, or whoever, uh, you have to convince the mayor as well. So get his buy-in on those solutions and get him to be a part of those initial discussions is very key in getting to solutions to the problem. And I, I would say too, questions. just, just Sorry, one more add, uh, I, I would say don't let perfection be the enemy of, of effective as well. Um, sometimes I think with the data gathering and the, the GIS work, it's always a moving target. It's really difficult to get it perfect and keep it there. <laughs> It's it's uh, there's always changing attributes and uh, new parts of the system. I mean, there, there's just a lot. So I would say you know get it 90 95 percent and then start to work down that that process and then keep keep it going in a loop. Like keep keep working towards better data, but don't let it hold you up from doing the other the other really good things that lead you to a plan. Sorry, David. No, absolutely. That was great. Um, I was just going to add the last question that I think we've got is for Harold, which is for Carrie. Is the stormwater working group continuing to play a role in town decisions beyond the downtown improvement area? That's a good question. I should know the answer to that question. I don't. I don't know the answer to that question. I think they still exist. I don't think they're meeting regularly. Uh, I know that we are monitoring flooding data and who we are monitoring that data. I'm not really sure if that is that committee or it's just staff. 
but I do know what they recommended as far as monitoring the streams and the flooding issues is being used and is ongoing. I'm just not sure if that original committee still exists. All right, well, I think we've caught up with basically all the questions. So, uh, thank you all very much for your time and I think we're ready to turn it back over to Michelle for any closing comments. Thanks you guys for that wonderful presentation. And uh, again, I just wanna thank you guys for taking out time for your busy schedule um, to assist us um, with this webinar. So thanks again, John, Harold, and David. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, and um, they will actually, this recording will be on the website along with the copy of their slides. That should be up, up there Friday, Monday at the latest. So um, we will get that uploaded. So if you guys want to use that for any uh, future references, that will be accessible to each and every one of you. So, but thanks again, and you guys have a wonderful rest of the day.